Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to welcome you all to the fifth and final session of our Conference on Orthodox Liturgy. It's my privilege uh, to introduce our two speakers and to chair this session. Our first speaker, Reverend Dr. Stephanos Alexopoulos, serves as a parish priest in the Archdiocese of Athens, Greece. He is no stranger to us here at Helena College of Holy Cross. He graduated from Helena College um, with his BA in 1995 and from Holy Cross in 1998. He received his PhD in lit liturgical studies from the University of Notre Dame, studied under Father Robert Taft in 2004. Since then, and even actually during that time, uh, Father Stephanos has been very busy in publishing as well as teaching um, in his home country of Greece. We were very fortunate last spring to have, her, have Father Stephanos speak here um, at Holy Cross for one of our Cantonist lectures in Byzantine studies while he was visiting at Yale University as a visiting professor in liturgy at the Institute of Sacred Music and Arts. As I mentioned already, he has published in English, Greek, and German, and Russian, and he is the author of a very important study the pre-sanctified liturgy in the Byzantine Rite a comparative analysis of its origins, evolution, and structural units. We are pleased to welcome him back to his alma mater, and he will be speaking to us today on the title, although I'm not sure where to put the question mark, but maybe it's the very end. Uh, okay, very good. Uh, liturgical renewal in Greece, past, present, future. Thank you, Father. <laughs> Thank you very much. Let me say it's a great honor and pleasure to be here at the school, at our school, and uh, stand before you. Before I begin, I would like to dedicate this uh, my presentation to the memory of Father Dimitrios Zepos, uh, a great scholar of liturgy, uh, dedicated priest, and a wonderful person. He was the first secretary of this special synodal committee of liturgical renewal, of which you will be um, hearing about. And he also uh, was responsible for the editing of, of some of the more recent liturgical books that the Church of Greece has published through Apostolic Diagonia, the latest Apostolos, uh, Epistle Lectionary and Gospel Lectionary, uh, are uh, the works of his hands. May his memory be eternal. On October 1st um, of last year, Petros Vasiliadis, professor of the School of Theology of the University of Thessaloniki, published an online article with the title, Has the End of Liturgical Renewal Arrived? As expected from his rather pessimistic title, Vasiliadis <laughs> expressed his frustration regarding the current state of liturgical renewal in the Church of Greece, a frustration fueled by the lack of any fruitful dialogue with those who oppose the notion of liturgical renewal, by the labeling of those supporting liturgical renewal as heretics, and by the apparent, according to Vasiliadis, lack of interest from the current leadership of the Church of Greece. Although I share some of Vasiliadis' frustrations, I would not present such a gloomy picture. On the contrary, I would argue that in spite of the criticisms and sometimes really vicious attacks that the liturgical renewal and its proponents have received and are still receiving, the liturgical renewal is still alive, enjoying the official support of the Holy Synod of the Church of Greece and his Beatitude, the Archbishop of Athens and all Greece, Hieronymus. The fact that liturgy is at the center of current discussions is due to the liturgical renewal. The awareness that the Orthodox Church is first and foremost a liturgical church and that it is defined by its liturgical tradition is largely owed to liturgical renewal. I would strongly argue that liturgical renewal is not only current but is needed today more than ever in order to safeguard us from attitudes towards worship that lack any historical basis, theological depth 
and pastoral sensitivity. Therefore, the systematic study of the history of the worship of the church can only enhance our understanding of liturgy, its function and its role in the life of the church. And that is exactly the role of liturgical renewal, to lead to a personal and communal renewal in Christ through a deeper knowledge, greater appreciation, and more conscious participation in the worship of the church. After all, liturgy is not just texts, rites, rituals, and rubrics. It's the encounter with the mystery of God, the now and not yet of the Christian experience, the visible expression of faith. Liturgical renewal as the movement to safeguard the liturgical tradition of the church and rekindle the liturgical experience of the faithful is not something recent. Its roots in modern Greek ecclesiastical history can be traced back to the Codivades in the 18th and 19th centuries where issues such as frequency of communion, the correction of liturgical books and liturgical practice were at the forefront. Although originally an Athenite monastic movement, the expulsion of the Colivadas from Mount Athos actually gave their views a wider audience, and I would argue that it laid the foundation for a respectfully critical approach to the then liturgical uh, practice and theology. The first efforts to address the challenges of parish worship and adjust the liturgical tradition to the pastoral reality of parishes lie in the early 1800s, when the Patriarchate of Constantinople amended and adjusted the monastic neo-sabaitic liturgical practice as reflected in the Tipicon of Aitiosavas to parish needs. The product of this effort was the publication of the Tipicon of Corsadinos Protopsaldis or Visadios in 1838, revised by George Violakis in 1888. It is this Tipicon with certain further adjustments due to the calendar change in the 1920s that regulates the liturgical life in Greek parishes today. In the meantime, Greek liturgical scholarship through the work of figures such as Ambrosios Stavrinos, <coughs> Kostadinos Kalinikos, Athanasios Papadopoulos Keramevs, and Manuel Yadeon, published important liturgical sources and highlighted both the centrality of liturgy in the Orthodox Church, but also the need to systematically study the liturgical books and make corrections when needed. As a result, and by the initiative of the Patriarchate of Constantinople, a Patriarchal Committee was established in 1932, having as its aim the correction and critical addition of the liturgical books of the Greek-speaking part of the Orthodox Church. Unfortunately, the life of this committee was very short, its work being interrupted by World War II and never resumed. And the committee included great ecclesiastical and academic figures, such as Panagiot Strebelas. It is he that produced the first fruits of this committee in the publication of his classic Etris Liturgia Cata Tus and Athenas Codicas, the three liturgies, the three liturgies according to the codices house of the National Library of Athens. And still, this book is considered a classic. Trebelas continued his work in liturgical studies by publishing critical editions using primarily the manuscripts at hand at the National Library of Athens in, of Greece, and studies on various sacraments and offices gathered in two important volumes, Nikron of Kologio, uh, Volume 1 and Volume 2, uh, Volume 2, dealing with sacraments of marriage, baptism, unction, ordination, great and small blessing of the waters, dedication of churches, and the prayers of matins and vespers. These important works were done within the framework of the Patriarchal's, Patriarchal Committee's vision. The work of Trebelas was continued by Evangelos Theodoru and especially by the late Ioannis Fodoulis. Fodoulis actually made Thessaloniki the center for liturgical studies in Greece and attracted numerous students from Greece and abroad. It is fair to say that modern liturgical studies in Greece bear the seal of Fodoulis and I would say liturgical studies at Holy Cross bear the seal of Fodoulis as Father Galigos was Fodoulis' student. 
The late Metropolitan Dionysios Tsarianos of Kozani should also be mentioned for his vision of renewal of liturgical life and experience. The late Archbishop Christodoulos proved to be a turning point regarding the discussion on liturgical renewal in the Church of Greece. By issuing an encyclical on liturgical renewal in 1998, and especially by founding the Special Synodical Committee on Liturgical Renewal in 1999, he initiated a renewed interest in liturgical studies and fueled the ensuing discussion regarding liturgical renewal. It is significant to note that the work and contribution of the Special Synodical Committee on Liturgical Renewal is continuing today with the blessing of the current Archbishop Hieronymus. The greatest contribution of the Special Synodical Committee is without any doubt the annual liturgy conference it organizes on specific liturgical themes. It is within this context the Greek liturgists meet, discuss, present their research and more importantly in the presence of clergy representing all the metropolises of the Church of Greece provide ample opportunity for open discussions and reflections. Furthermore, the proceedings of each conference not only are published by the Church of Greece and sent to all clergy, but they're also available online through the website of the Holy Synod of the Church of Greece, thus building a collection of scholarly liturgical volumes to be used as reference and study on various liturgical topics. To this day, 14 such conferences have taken place with the following themes. I'll just run through them. Uh, baptism, liturgical renewal, divine liturgy, marriage, ministering the gospel, the liturgy of the word, and the role of scriptural readings in the Orthodox Church, Christian worship and idolatry, the mystery of priesthood, liturgical year, death and dying, health and illness, liturgical education, liturgical history, like turning, uh, turning points in the formation of worship, liturgical language, a very significant conference that addressed the issue of language in the, in the Church of Greece, and the liturgical arts. A review of recent liturgical scholarship in Greece demonstrates the fact that the present generation of Greek liturgists is actively engaged in scholarly research and writing, and the young students and clergy are increasingly interested in graduate work in liturgy. Without any doubt, these annual liturgical conferences have fueled research in the area of liturgical history and theology and have sparked a lively dialogue within the church. As I have elsewhere noted, I have observed that discussions about liturgy in popular understanding usually vacillates between two extreme positions. On the one hand, seeing all current practices as normative, normal and historical clothing them with a romantic veil of changelessness and branding them traditional, even if they reflect recent changes in worship. Or, on the other hand, seeing no practice as normative, normal and historical, but rather seeking to change, alter and reform worship so that it fits the tastes, trends and whims of any individual or group, so that worship may become relevant whatever that might mean. Proponents of liturgical renewal are unfortunately grouped in the latter category as sometime, or sometimes even labeled as neo-heretics. And liturgical renewal is seen as a movement that opposes liturgical tradition. Quite the contrary. I strongly believe, and I emphasize that strongly and that belief, I strongly believe that liturgical renewal actually is the guarantor of a liturgical tradition as it highlights the necessity for the study of the history of worship and the need for the development of, the, of a theology of worship that is based on the actual liturgical texts. In other words, we need to know the history of what we celebrate and why we celebrate it and use the liturgical tool, texts as a hermeneutic tool when doing theology of worship. Liturgical renewal, then, is not a break from tradition. In fact, I would argue that liturgical renewal safeguards our liturgical tradition. Liturgical renewal points and leads to the restoration of proper liturgical practice. And liturgical renewal allows us to rediscover the catechetical power of liturgy. 
Let us examine each of these statements individually. Yes, indeed, liturgical renewal safeguards and protects our liturgical <coughs> tradition. It highlights the centrality of worship in the Orthodox tradition and allows us to move to a deeper experience, wider knowledge and greater understanding of worship. Liturgical renewal protects the liturgical tradition from the extremes of secularism, clericalism, rubricalism, and ritualism. Allow me to provide some similar case studies as examples in order to demonstrate my point. Liturgical renewal protects us from, the, from abuses of liturgical space. Let us take, for example, the holy table in the holy altar. The holy table, the focal point in the Orthodox Church, is not and should not function as storage space. <laughs> Placing on it or under it any conceivable liturgical or even non-liturgical objects or items. And, and, you know, I can give you a lot of uh, examples of stuff that I've seen, either on the altar or under the altar table. Neither should it become a showcase of liturgical objects clustered with excess decoration. So, these, the images I present present are uh, available to anyone online. These ecclesiastical news portals are a great resource. Obviously, I have blocked out the faces of the bishops and clergy. Um, these are not their own churches, so they're not to blame. But anyway, so why would a tabernacle serve as a basis for an icon of a saint on the altar, being the focal point on the holy altar? Okay, how many gospel books do we need? <laughs> Definitely we need one. But we need to showcase the beautiful gospel books that we have uh, in the Diakonikon. Or why does the cross need a special placement? <laughs> Some people would call this Visadini Megaloprepia, Byzantine Majesty. I call it, I call it Neo-Greek clutter. <laughs> Similarly, liturgical vestments are to be worn in liturgical services, not hung in a decorative fashion on the pillars of the ciborium, the baldacchino of the altar, or on the pillars of the icon screen. Here, this is a picture from uh, Eskito Mantafos, and here you have four petrachilia priest stoles hanging from the columns of the ciborium. Why? Here, and this has moved outside, here, this is a parish pre, this is a parish church. You have one petrachili, two petrachilia, three petrachilia, and four petrachilia. Why would you have these petrachilia hanging at definitely as a decorative fashion? Because they're all the same. And I would have here, this is an, a, a hand carved a wooden icon screen. Why would you cover the carvings with both? Yes. Here. It is a fact that one finds in monasteries priest stoles hung on the two columns of each side of the central doors, for example here and here. But there it is done so because the daily offices are celebrated outside the altar. In other words, in that particular context, that practice serves a practical need. But this practice has no meaning in a parish setting. Liturgical renewal protects from abuses of liturgical practice and allows for the correction of erroneous liturgical practices that found their ways in the liturgical books. This is a hot issue. The secret or silent recitation of the prayers of the divine liturgy by the celebrant has been a long tradition that has, however, strongly been challenged by all serious liturgical scholars. This practice has led to some very significant abuses. For example, I have witnessed, I'm sure you have witnessed, celebrants skimming through or mumbling the prayers, or even skipping the prayers instead of reading them, only chanting the ekphonesis, the doxological conclusion of each. 
But even if all the prayer were said would, would to be properly read silently, they have two significant consequences. The dramatic elongation of chanted elements and responses, and the mobility of prayers within the divine liturgy. In the first case, the longer and thus more difficult chants inhibit the participation of the congregation in the responses. In the second case, the prayers are read out of their sequence and in isolation of their proper place and context in the liturgy. In this way, the structure of the divine liturgy, but also of each particular prayer, is not respected as the prayer is separated from its doxological conclusion, the ekphonesis. What is even more striking is that this theological and structural abuse, and I consciously use the term abuse, of the divine liturgy found its way in printed editions, thus codifying a mainstreaming, a clearly erroneous practice stemming from the secret or silent recitation of the prayers of the divine liturgy. So here, you see, this is a the published in 1895 from the Patriarchal Press in Constantinople. So here, this is a, right after the Vlogimeni Vasilia, Blessed be the Kingdom, the Sinapti. And then you have the Ekphonesis, oh, the Ekphonesis, and then the prayer. So this should actually be done here. And this was continued to be the practice and was even copied by editions of Apostolic Diaconia the official printing press of the Church of Greece. So here you have uh, 1951, <coughs> the Ekphonesis and the prayer. The Ekphonesis and the prayer. The Ekphonesis and the prayer. And there are tons of other examples that thankfully were not codified by the printing press. Um, it is the principles of liturgical renewal, that is, the study of the history of worship and theological reflection on the actual liturgical texts that led to the correction of current printed editions and the movement towards the audible recitation of the prayers of the divine liturgy. So current editions of the Church of Greece have the Ekphonesis restored to its proper place and each prayer, the liturgy, has the proper flow. Now what priests do is another story, but at least the printed text is, is correct. <laughs> My second point, liturgical renewal points and leads to the restoration of, of proper liturgical practice. The fall of the Iron Curtain in Eastern Europe and the location of Greece within the current worldwide immigration routes have led to a sharp increase of adult baptisms in Greece in the last two decades. But how are these candid candidates for baptism enrolled, catechized and baptized? In the current process, in the current practice, the process is initiated by the candidate catechumen who writes an application letter to the local bishop expressing his or her wish to be catechized and baptized. Catechesis begins with the response letter of the bishop and the appointment of a catechist priest. After a series of meetings, usually held in the church office, with a format of a private lesson, the catechumen is baptized in a privately celebrated ceremony with a baptismal rite that is in fact adapted to the baptism of infants. In this short description of the current process of catechesis, one realizes two things. The radical absence of the liturgical context of catechesis and the radical absence of the Christian community. But if we look in the history of catechesis, we will discover that what we just described was always done in a liturgical context. And that liturgical framework of catechesis survives in our liturgical tradition, especially in the context of Great Lent and Holy Week. The study of the history of liturgy allows us to understand certain liturgical peculiarities of Lent and Holy Week, such as the sequence of readings at Vespers, the petitions for the Photizomeni, the number of readings at the Vesperal Liturgy of St. Basil on the Holy Saturday, the presence of Osius Christon, replacing the Trisagion in the aforementioned liturgy, and the Liturgy of Lazarus Saturday, and enables us to reposition the initiation of adults in its proper liturgical framework and restore the active role of the local bishop in the whole process.
In other words, establish set days during the year when the new catechumens are enrolled in the presence of the local bishop who meets with them and reads over them the prayer of the making of the catechumen. Restore the active role of the bishop in the process of catechesis by meeting with the catechumens and reading over them the exorcisms. Formally invite them on the third Sunday of Lent, that is the Sunday of the Adoration of the Cross, Invite those who enter the final stage of the catechumenate and become fotizomen. Actually, in the sources there is such a text, prosphonitikon to katechumenon, which invites those that are to be initiated to uh, come forth and they become the fotizomeni. And that's why we have the petitions of the fotizomeni in current practice starting that, that fourth week of Lent in the Presanctified. And I would suggest, based on the manuscript tradition, also restore the petitions of the Fotizomeni on Sundays, as it's witnessed in the manuscript tradition. Have the local bishop gather on the Holy Friday all the Fotizomeni, where the renunciation of the devil and acceptance, acceptance of Christ is made, the, is, the, the creed is recited, and the bishop reads over them the prayer of invitation to baptism. And according to our manuscript witness, that's when all these things took place. Restore the celebration of baptism during the readings of Vesper Liturgy of Basil on Holy Saturday, celebrated by a bishop. That's why we have so many readings that day. Because during the readings, baptism will take place. And restore mystagogy on Bright Week, as was the practice in the early church. In this way, the pastoral reality of adult catechesis and baptism is addressed in a liturgical way, reintroducing it within the communal liturgical life of the Orthodox Church by employing the already present structures within the Orthodox liturgical tradition. At the same time, these structures will regain their meaning and thus the community will be made part of the whole process. Liturgical renewal then, through the study of liturgical history, together with a respectful but critical examination of the received liturgical tradition, allows us to rediscover liturgical structures and frameworks and to understand particular elements in our own liturgical tradition and restore, when needed, proper liturgical practice. And my third point, liturgical renewal allows us to rediscover the catechetical power of liturgy. Opponents of liturgical renewal argue that there is a sharp distinction between understanding and mystical participation, whatever that mystical part means, in the context of worship, identifying the former, the understanding, with intellectualism. This is a false dichotomy. The worship experience, the prayers of the church, are not only means for the worship and glorification and adoration of God, but they are also catechetical tools telling us what we believe, why we believe, and what effect our belief should have in our daily lives. I consider the prayer of the Gospel, read before the Gospel readings, a paradigm that presents to us the balance between the necessary comprehension of the human mind and divine illumination, which lead to the living of the Christian life as an outcome both of a conscious decision and the divine encounter in worship. We have to have both. The emphasis, obviously, is mine. Shine within our hearts, loving Master, the pure light of your divine knowledge, and open the eyes of our minds, that we may comprehend the message of your Gospel. Instill in us also reverence for your blessed commandments, so that having conquered all sinful desires, we may pursue a spiritual life, thinking and doing all thing, all those things that are pleasing to you, and so on. In other words, I would argue that the prayer of the Gospel reveals and set, sets before our eyes the catechetical power of liturgy. To conclude, I believe that it has been demonstrated that liturgical renewal is not a rejection of liturgical of tradition and traditional forms of worship. On the contrary, it safeguards liturgical, tra it safeguards liturgical tradition, it allows for the restoration of proper liturgical practice, and highlights the catechetical power of liturgy. I also strongly believe 
that all discussion about our liturgical tradition and the meaning and purpose of liturgical renewal should be done in a spirit of peace, dialogue, and mutual respect. I personally have a, have a particular dislike for labels such as conservative or traditionalist or liberal or restorationist or you, you can fill the gaps. As a student of mine once remarked, labels are for jars. And she's absolutely right. We do not need labels in the church. I strongly believe that all in the church share the same love, dedication and respect towards our liturgical tradition and all voices need to be heard but in a context of a real dialogue, not parallel monologues. Only in this way will we be able to rediscover the riches of our liturgical tradition, be renewed in our experience within it, and engage our, our tradition with the questions, challenges, and realities of modernity. Only then will liturgical renewal bear fruits. Only then will liturgical renewal have a future. After all, our tradition is a living tradition always making current its theological responses to the great issues of each era. Thank you for your time. the restoration of the catechumen for the catechumens, 
but how when this is carried out properly, it transforms the entire parish. At the, at the meeting of the North American Academy of Liturgy that was held years and years and years ago at uh, Washington, D.C., uh, a Roman Catholic priest who was the pastor of a uh, African-American parish, a black parish in D.C., he himself is not an African-American. His name was Ray Kemp, if I'm not mistaken, K-E-M-P. And he published, his paper was published in worship, and he showed how following the RCIA, <laughs> as it's supposed to be, that is to say by involving the entire parish community in carrying these people through this process, it not only catechizes the catechumens, it transforms the life of the parish. An extremely interesting article. Thank, thank you, Father. Um, and it's a very significant point because what you see in Orthodox, what I, I observe as an Orthodox priest uh, in, 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 in the context of a parish, the approach to worship is usually individualistic. It's always God and I, you know, my relationship to God. The neighbor doesn't exist. And, uh, you know, when, whenever I have talked, whenever we talk in, our, in my parish about, okay, let's do something more, try to, because we've had, since 1999, we've had about over 50 adult baptisms in my parish. And whenever I have, um, uh, suggested uh, return to this type of outline, uh, the objection is always practical. Oh, we need to clean up the church after, you know, the liturgy in the morning so it's ready for, for uh, 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 the resurrection service at night. Oh, the people will react because it's going to be a long service. So, both people, but especially I'll start with the clergy because that's where I place the weight, uh, that's where I place the responsibility. <coughs> We don't take uh, the bold decisions to try and do something. We just sit there, receive whatever the received tradition of each parish is. Uh, I'm not saying we go there and change everything rapidly from day one. But after we establish ourselves and after we get to know our people, gradually but surely try to reinvigorate worship so that worship does not, is not anymore an individualistic act but it's a communal act, a community act. Father, thank you for your presentation. Um, I have a number of uh, individuals who are seeking to either be chrismated and or baptized this year, and I was trying to align it with what you said. Practically speaking, Holy Saturday, would this be done in the narthex? or because most churches don't have that, as it, the ancient church did with the font in the back or even an adult font, would it take place in the front? And then also would chrismation also take place on Holy Saturday at the same time? Yeah, I, would, I would do, if you want to engage your community, I would do it in the front. Uh, because if you do it in the north, X, everyone will see, everyone will have their backs to you, or they, they, even if they turn towards the north, they won't, they won't be able to see anything, so what's the point? Um, and would it take place during the readings, as you said? Is that what yeah, I mean, there are, there are, I mean, if you go to the, um, um, uh, to the volume of baptism, Fodulis actually had made a, uh, an outline of how you would do that, and I also have an article published that, that sort of like delineates that. Uh, there are ways that you can do it. Uh, but the idea is to do it <coughs> then. You put the back, Peter, can you hit him on my computer? Mm -hmm. Here, I'm trying to turn it on. Okay. Hi there. Um, wonderful uh, talk. Very inspiring. Uh, two quick questions. Could you clarify what you mean by the restoration of the mystagogy during Bright Week? And the second is a more general question. How. Uh, six months, and now 14 years after the, the uh, establishment of the liturgical renewal initiative of the Church of Greece, how successful would you say it has been in the last 14 years in um, the gradual change of the liturgical landscape of the Church? 
Well, mystagogy, I mean, if you go to the great mystagogues of the 4th and 5th century, after you would have the catechesis and the baptism, that would continue with continued education in a sense, but like a further, deeper initiation in what just happened. That's why it was called mystagogy. You, you enter into the mystery and you get to know that and explore that. We don't do that. We baptize people and then they're on their own. Um, you know, uh, let's organize that. Uh, that so that's, all I'm, uh, that's all I'm suggesting. You not abandon people on their own after they've been baptized. You know, attracting, uh, uh, you know, having new converts in the church is not a number game. Oh, we have 500 converts, 700 converts, and oh, I'm better because I have more. But it's, you know, the quality. What do we do with these people? Uh, how do we, what's the support system after they get baptized? And that's very crucial for the church because they can fall prey to movements and ideas that are very, uh, to put it very mildly, wrong. Um, <laughs> I mean, your second question? Which is the, the, the oh, success? The, the, yeah, I would say, I would say that given the, um, the whole situation and the tendencies and some and uh, I would say generally I'm happy. I think the fact, just the fact, if let's say the, the synod of the Church of Greece decided to pull the plug from this committee, just the fact that we have had 14 conferences that has, that has updated Greek liturgical bibliography because all modern Greek liturgists um, read. Father Taft, Father Tibiadis, all the great liturgists, and actually incorporate the, the findings in their work. Just that, to me, is a huge success. Because now, Greek liturgical scholarship is current to what's going on. Uh, which wasn't the case uh, in this depth and width, you know, 15 years ago. So, uh, can more things be done? Sure, but I'm happy. You know, we can't have everything. One more question. Who, who did I? Sorry. The, Father, thank you very much for your wonderful presentation and also for the reminder of, of how much is, is going on in Greece and how much we still have to learn from Greece and as you just said, and how willing they are to learn from us. And, and I look forward to that going forward in the future, definitely. Uh, the, the specific recommendations you had or, or examples of, of reform seem to me pretty, pretty understandable. What's the most controversial uh, idea for liturgical renewal uh, that, that specialists would like to see happen within the Church of Greece? Well, I would say, I, would, I won't stick to the specialist because sometimes, you know, we think of things that it's nice in our heads. Well, let's talk about myself. You know, I leave the others. I, I have many ideas, but these are in the sphere of fantasy. Um, a real, a real issue that's at the hot potato issue is the issue of language. In other words, what language is it to be used in worship in Greece today? I mean, our language is Byzantine Greek. The readings are done all in ancient in, in the New Testament Greek. Uh, the prayers are all in this New Testament of Byzantine Greek. The poetry is from very simple Byzantine Greek to Homeric Greek. There's a huge variety. So but the whole issue of you know comprehension of this language uh, becomes more and more a burning issue. And the, and the church's response was this conference in 2011. The liturgical language of the church today. And I have to say, that this, land, this conference, I think, was a huge success. And why was, it, why was it a huge success? Because it managed, within this heightened political uh, atmosphere of animosity and whatever, within, within the different uh, um, uh, movements in the church, it managed to bring around the same table people that were representing ideas from the whole spectrum. So in the same conference organized by the official church, that's very important, you had people who were all in favor of liturgical translations in Greece here and now, to people on the other side of the spectrum who said, no way, neither now nor never. 
And actually, there was a dialogue. And I think that's the most important thing. I think that is it. because we sat down and listened to one another in a respectful kind of in a respectful context. To me, that was I mean, if I if you ask me which of the all of all these fourteen would you pick, I would say this by far. Um, now, the reactions to this question, I mean, you have, as I said, people who say it's a personal reality, people don't understand the language, uh, let's do it now. From the 14, 15 speakers, there were two or three that represented this type of immediate reform. On the other side of the spectrum, there are another three or four who said, no, and never. Why? Because the Greek language is the language of the New Testament. That's the language of our theology. Uh, the theological concepts cannot be rendered into modern Greek. And uh, they also connect with the whole issue of language with uh, the Greek nation. And there was the majority of stands stood in the middle that, that recognized the problem. It's a real problem. Uh, believe me, as a parish priest, uh, it's a real problem. So they recognized the need. They said, this must be done, but in due time, not now. Which is sort of like, to be honest, uh, it's sort of like a nice way out. You know, you recognize the problem, but you leave, uh, you know, for future generations to deal with the problem. It's sort of like what the, you know, what the Congress does with the budget. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, so there's, a lot of, there's a lot of dialogue and conflict on this issue, but I think this Congress is a, is a paradigm of how discussion should be made. Thank you very much, Father. Our next speaker is Sister Dr. Vassalari. Sister Dr. Vassalard is an American-born Russian Orthodox nun who has authored many scholarly articles and a very important monograph on the Byzantine liturgy titled The Byzantine Hierarchical Divine Liturgy in Arsenij Suksanov's Proskinitarij, which was published in the Orientalia Christiana Analekta. Since 2009, Sister Lawrence has been teaching liturgical studies at the Catholic Faculty of the University of Vienna in Austria. She received her doctorate from the um, Orthodox Institute of the Ludwig Maximilianus University in Munich, where she also received her Master of Theology. She also served for two years um, as Professor Taft's teaching assistant or graduate assistant, and she has just been awarded a very a lucrative and important research grant um, for work in continuing studies in Byzantine liturgy. Um, which will be carried out in Rome. It's my pleasure to welcome her today, and she will be speaking to us on the liturgical crisis of Russian Orthodoxy today, when words lose their meaning. Thank you, and I want to thank, first and foremost, um, Professor Zimaris for his kind invitation to come to Holy Cross. I have not had much contact with this um, institution and it's an honor to be here and to have contact with the Greek Orthodox in North America. It's funny how until recently our jurisdictions have not really crossed paths much. So it's, it's a nice phenomenon that we have. And I think we are also being introduced to some of the diversity in our unity and I think we would be shocked to really uh, take a closer look at what Orthodox down the street are doing. You know, I was recently at a uh, very interesting Antiochian Orthodox uh, retreat in Kansas, and I had to study the Antiochian version of the Tipicon in order to present a series of papers there. And, you know, it was a new world for me. I, even things that they do at the Paschal Vigil at very central moments, I had never heard of. And I, you know, daughter of a priest who grew up in the church, but you know, I never heard of these things. So this is, I think, refreshing, and it's sort of a consolation on um, 
uh, the topic of my paper and of all the papers here that we also have uh, very similar problems. So um, we're not alone in that. So I will be covering some of the ground that has repeatedly been covered in the previous very um, impressive papers. And uh, Father Stefano, uh, you're a hard act to follow, but uh, what can I do about that? So uh, I will begin by defining my terms, because when you see a term like crisis, uh, you can think all sorts of things. So I will, um, again, uh, repeat that I will be covering some of the ground that has been covered. However, like all of us, I will have maybe simplifications and also slightly, uh, a slightly different take on these, on the problematics of this topic. So, we'll begin with the term crisis. Of course, this comes fr uh, from the substantive, from krino, meaning all sorts of things, but mostly separate, to distinguish, to decide. So, we will be concentrating on these aspects of crisis uh, that in any event could mean decision or judgment, a choice, a trial. And all of these meanings have this in common, that they mean a turning point of some sort. But that uh, can also mean a crucial moment, for, of course from crux, crucis, crucial, being a crossroads. So um, this can have either a positive or a negative ending, this kind of situation. Now, in the context of any complex system, I will be operating with this definition of crisis, because this is helpful in understanding what we mean by a liturgical crisis. When outer forms continue to exist, but have ceased to fulfill their purpose. This could also be the case in a marital crisis. There is an outward situation that is supposed to be accomplishing something and it's not working anymore. So I mean this uh, when I talk about liturgical crisis in Russian Orthodoxy. This kind of situation involves an upset in equilibrium. And I'll just throw that out there because right now I'm just laying the, the basis for what I will be observing in this paper. But it's also a process and a process of transformation. And we should note uh, right at the beginning that this uh, can be positive or negative. It's an opportunity for either growth or decline. Now let's uh, look a little bit more closely at this word that I'm using. It has been defined already many times during this, the course of this conference. What is the purpose of liturgy? And as many, you know, as many people as you hear define tradition, you know, that's also, <laughs> you'll hear the, an equal number of definitions of what the purpose of liturgy is. I will be operating with the original purpose, I think, from which, from this purpose, all of the other purposes um, really uh, stem. Uh, and this is uh, the purpose that was uh, named by the Lord himself when he says to us uh, why we should do this. And he says, Tuto anamnisin. And this anamnesis is what makes possible this living memory of the church makes possible all sorts of other things, including something like change that has been mentioned as a purpose of the liturgy. Because the liturgist among you might know that something like change, the first time it is actually referenced in context of Eucharistic theology is in Justin's apology, and I believe that's in, you know, uh, the first apology in the middle chapter of those three chapters relevant to liturgy, that would be chapter 66, when he says that we are nurtured by the body and blood of Christ, and what he means by that is um, sort of open to interpretation, but the interesting thing is, of course, uh, a living memory of the Lord, <coughs> with all the implications, leads uh, both to our constant transformation um, and also to um, thanksgiving, which makes uh, Eucharist uh, what it is, and so on. So 
I will be uh, concentrating on anamnesis because of these two important uh, facts about our liturgical memory that, and again, I, I will repeat that I'm going through this long introduction in order to uh, point out why I, I see the situation in my church as a crisis. Now, analysis has to include both the timeless and the temporal. The timeless is, of course, that which abides, the abiding norm of the life of the Lord, of the truths of our faith, the eternal mystery that is revealed in any celebration or feast. This doesn't change. However, this mystery is revealed at a specific point in time. And I think that this aspect, the historical aspect, upon which actually the Creed also insists, you know, when you're looking at this phrase, et pipon dio pilato, stagrothenda de peribon, et pipon dio pilato, you're thinking, why is Pilate in the Creed? The specific point in time, under Pontius Pilate, he was crucified for us. The historical aspect is crucial because of our, in the East, you know, because of the history of our theological development, uh, the tendency to explain things in neoplatonic terms. The danger in our church history was to gravitate towards a symbolic or symbolgestalt, a symbolic system that had, was really in the danger of divorcing itself from history. It's not a myth, it's not a, a, a parable. And Florovsky liked to write, uh, repeat the words of Marc Bloch, a Jewish-French social historian. You know, he begins his famous article on the predicament of the Christian historian. Christianity is the religion of historians. That's so important. The creed is from the beginning to the end, very historical statement. So we don't believe in the ideas of Plato that are divorced. That system is divorced from a historical reality. That's the difference, that's why Trullo doesn't allow us to depict uh, a historical um, it, uh, pictures of Christ. Why? Because nobody saw him as a you know, shepherd uh, or a fish. The symbolic depiction, when it's divorced from history, why can't you depict God the Father as a bearded man? Nobody saw him. We do it anyway, of course, but that's the way we are in the East. That's our charm. <laughs> <laughs> so, this, uh, this is something I would like to uh, stress right now, that liturgy symbolically reminds us of the mystery revealed to us in history. So, we keep talking about, and as Stephanos and others have so eloquently put today the importance of mystagogy. But we have also heard us here and there insist on learning the history. And this is also for theological reasons, for very uh, important reasons in our theology that perhaps even in the era of the mystagogical commentaries was never really, um, I don't think it received the attention it needed. And we have a crisis that did not happen the day before yesterday, and I think that a certain um, gravitation towards the mystical without um, a, a necessary balance with uh, the historical vision, our common memory, which is embedded in history, uh, I think that that could be at the root of many of our very century-old problems. So now, let's look at Again, we had in our definition of crisis, uh, we said that a, that a complex system would follow a definition that we've offered of outer forms existing but no longer fulfilling their function. Um, let's look at the Byzantine liturgical system and point out something that I think needs to be pointed out, especially in the context of my church, where, and Stephanos talked about this as well, uh, you might be challenged, and it might be said that you're intellectualizing, or we don't really need this rationalization. It's almost like a Latin heresy to think too much. <laughs> it is concerned with being intelligible, and it is concerned with conveying the word. It seems to be obvious, but um, it should be obvious, but I don't think it is. So let's point that out. 
This is according to an ancient principle of Christian worship that we've heard even in Justinian's novella 137 that we've heard from 565 uh, referred to here about the reading of prayers audibly. Um, 1 Corinthians 14 is what he quotes in there if you looked at that document. If you give thanks with your spirit, how can anyone in the position of an outsider say amen to your thanksgiving when he does not know what you are saying? For you may be giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not being built up. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Nevertheless, in church I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. And this, I think, every, all of us should know by heart in case we come up against the opposition to intelligibility and liturgy, which surprisingly we have even among our clergy. So this is actually in the New Testament. And um, <laughs> so the uh, Latin rationalist that Paul was, I don't know, um, we can consider that an authority. So the the built-in mechanism that uh, is in the Byzantine Symbolgestalt, or system of symbols, is a connection between icon and word. When you have an icon, uh, I think that all of us here know that you have to have the inscription. The icon, the image, is accompanied by the word. Um, so I will immediately go on to the liturgical application of that, because liturgy, of course, is an image. It's, it operates with symbols. And there is also a connection uh, between liturgy and word. Uh, this icon that the liturgy is has to have the word. And uh, I will just explain what I mean by liturgy always being symbolic. It is realized through symbols. Uh, right now, I am. Um, going to operate with a very broad uh, definition of symbol, and I will explain what I mean, because do not uh, think that what I mean is necessarily the allegorical uh, explanations. I mean the basic fact about any Christian worship um, founded in and made possible in the Incarnation that it is symbolic. Why is all liturgy symbolic? The Church Fathers divided salvation history into three distinct periods. And we all know this if we know anything about theology. The Old Testament being the shadow, the time of the Church, the time that we live in is the time of images, and then there will be the reality, but we don't see God face to face. And we operate through images, through symbols. So here we have the time of symbols, and that is uh, liturgy operating through symbols. And this is true in both East and West. Uh, it can't possibly be otherwise, even though the actual um, explanations of this can be more or less um, further uh, interpreted in allegorical ways or not. However, the fact that liturgy is symbolic is true in both East and West. Take a look at this comment of a theologian of our time, we need the intermediary and do not yet see the Lord as he is. That is why the theology of the liturgy is, in a special way, symbolic theology. Who said this? Maybe not somebody you would expect. It's the Pope Emeritus Ratzinger. So, it's not different in, uh, in the West. The term symbol, just to further define this term, of course, comes from uh, symbol. It's from symbol to sort of throw or bring together to unite. So, what is being united in a symbol? It brings together two realities: the invisible and the visible. The interplay of a two-sided reality. This is all coming together in the symbol. The symbol, on the one hand, is working through the visible world and it is revealing and also hiding the sacrament or mystery perceived through faith. Of course, without faith, none of this works. It's, um, it has to, uh, it works on the basis of faith. 
Now, about the basis of the incarnation in all of this, and I am eventually getting to my point, uh, these two sides were present in Christ. In him one saw one thing, but understood another. One saw a man and believed it was God. So this Christ is, of course, the icon of the Father, the icon of our souls, and is, makes possible uh, our symbolic system. But one important thing, this is getting closer to our point, the incarnation, this appearance of Christ, the incarnation, was accompanied by the Word. So this icon, like our whole system, is based on this principle. The Logos Sarx Egenaton, it's so important to us, the Word, that we call God the Word, and He, His vision, He didn't just say, you know, here I am, and you figure out what it means. No, He left His Word. So this accompaniment of icon and word is based in the Incarnation. Uh, so this is what I'm repeating uh, many times right now to form the basis of our further reflections. And the mystery is related to the liturgical symbol, just as the two natures are connected in Christ. But the word cannot be absent from this picture. Now, that word that accompanies liturgy is what? First of all, the text of the liturgical prayers, accompanying the actions and um, processions and so on, the mystagogical commentaries that, interestingly enough, did not always, like Peter Jeffrey writes, that um, the commentary, the explanation always comes after um, the actual text. He says it's action, text, um, commentary, or interpretation. Interestingly, in the Byzantine liturgy, sometimes the actual interpretation uh, influenced very strongly the further development, like the development of the prophecies. So this is important in the Byzantine system. What does mystagogy mean? We heard Stephanos explain this already. It is, of course, from Mystis in Ago, an introduction into the mystery. Now, the Byzantine mystagogical commentaries were usually explanations of the faith before or sometimes after baptism, depending on the local tradition, or explanations of the divine liturgy, generally. As we heard today and previously, in our churches, this falls through the cracks. It doesn't happen very often when uh, infants are baptized and then nobody is really um, concerned with their further education. Note that mystagogy is to liturgy what exegesis is to scripture, as Father Taft has repeatedly pointed out in his writings. The point I'm making here, that there were, this is not a perfect uh, explanation or division, there were two basic theological tendencies in our tradition, and they called them Alexandrian or Antiochian. Like any systematization or generalization, of course, they didn't really exist in pure form. But to explain anything, you're going to generalize. So, the important thing here to note is that from the beginning there were different explanations. There, there are different ways of explaining liturgy. The one, as you know, is more historicizing in Antioch and we would say that the Alexandrian, Alexandrian tradition is more, again, I'm generalizing, spiritualizing, or I would say that the one would be more heavily interested in history, the other one more in uh, mystery. So what I would like to point out is that both of these are very important and that when either of them is uh, ignored, you can come to the point we are today where um, you have to question how Christian our worship is. Now, mystagogy and Lewis, this is only going to be brief. I will not be able to explain this, but there was a, a Lewis, the Russian tradition, had its own commentary called Tolkova and Slujba. This, this, there are scholars in Russia today that are studying this, but there hasn't been all that much written on it. It has very interesting moments, and just as an example uh, in this in this commentary, it is clear that the Russians believe that the concentration uh, consecration took place 
uh, at the Thalagia Tisagis, right before communion. And there's a very interesting depiction of at this moment, the angels descend and cut off the arms and the legs of the child and pour the blood into the chalice. And it's really sort of gross for our perception. But that was, uh, that's in this commentary. And there are interesting moments. But again, uh, the culture of the, uh, the Slavs uh, in the Kiev and, and the later Muscovite area uh, did uh, influence the way uh, the liturgy was explained. Now, Russian Orthodox liturgy today, keeping all of that in mind, we will look at symptoms of what we have called a crisis. Again, crisis can mean, uh, can end in growth or decline. So it's not necessarily negative. But first, let's look at um, an interesting phenomenon that uh, it's a vicious circle. We, the causes of our crisis also leads to the effect of the crisis. I don't know if that was a vicious circle, but it's the closest I could <laughs> <laughs> my PowerPoint experience. So the lack of mystological and historical instruction. Also, okay, that could be that's both a cause and effect, because the lack of what I, I insisted on mystagogy, uh, mystery and history being taught, it leads to an indifference that doesn't really care about actually um, having, uh, in, you know, historical and mystagogical instruction. Then we have this antiquated liturgical language, and the Church of Greece deals with this same problem. I will tell you more about the uh, what's been done in our day for that, or, or what's not been done. Um, there's, of course, the silent reading of the prayers. All of this uh, leads to unintelligibility. And Schmeland's diaries, there's an interesting comment where he visits a Russian Orthodox parish, probably of my church, the Court Court, and he says, he's really shocked at, it seems like the purpose is to understand as little as possible, because there's so much blocking intelligibility. It's as if that's like a purpose. Then, of course, we have no or little lay participation, and this is a problem, I think, across the boards in uh, most of our churches. I know that there are exceptions, but um, in the Russian Orthodox Church, this is very, um, uh, very extreme, I would say. Especially marginalized are children and women. These are demographic groups that just um, usually, by most liturgical, uh, traditional uh, liturgies, are marginalized. There is little or no congregational singing. Um, you know, in the, that's a little joke, don't worry, I was <laughs> um, the, the congregational singing is actually built into the Byzantine rite. The Kyrie Lay songs were made, uh, litany is, is actually was composed that way so that people had something easily memorizable to keep repeating. I mean, anybody can remember that. And having these concert, like, melodies for litanies is, you know, is incomprehensible because it, it makes it impossible for people to sing along. And even if you do sing along, people, the concern is, do you have a musical ear and you're bothering the choir and it's discouraged. So. Um, the, there are many, you know, antiphonal singing and the, the refrains and the Byzantine rite and the cathedral rite, I'm not talking about the monastic rite, we know that it has supposed to uh, have congregational singing. Um, we have interesting examples. I have um, an <coughs> article in press on St. Vladimir's Quarterly. I found an interesting example and um, uh, Alexander Lingus, uh, a very erudite musicologist that I think most of you know here, uh, he sent me one of his, um, uh, to, you know, when you, uh, and cipher, how do you say, and cipher, and, uh, anyway, he, he takes a manuscript, a Byzantine musical manuscript, and puts it into notes to it. All right. <laughs> okay, because I found in other sources as well, an interesting phenomenon, that the anaphora, and of course all the, the litanies, were, were just said by the Greeks in the, what we would call in the West, the Middle Ages, 
and there are musical manuscripts that show that the anaphora was practically no melody at all, and then you would have musical compositions for other hymns. But there were parts that the people actually said, like a Russian pilgrim to Jerusalem that observes the Greek liturgy there in the Anastasis in the 17th century, he says, he's surprised, he says, the Greeks say everything beginning with um, the mercy of peace, by the way, that's one of those senseless phrases. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> we know that in our clear pity here. So um, all that up to the axiom esteem is said. That's his impression. Whether they said it or did it recto tono, and he says, all the litanies are said. So this is, there were certain things that the musical zealots didn't touch, because that was for the, for the people to participate in. And today, you would, you know, the choir wants to have their interview call that's so beautiful and goes on endlessly, and, but that wasn't touched. That was something, it, and it's not a radical suggestion to return to what was actually done. The Russians didn't do it, I'll, I'll admit, but to learn from the example of the Greeks at that time that there was a compromise. You don't touch certain things. You don't abolish the beautiful musical traditions that all our churches have, but you, you know, you provide for, no matter what people's musical capabilities are, for certain parts that could be very well uh, simply recited and remove any of the musical problems of doing that. So, let's go on. The antiquated liturgical calendar, I have to add to this list because have you ever tried to explain to children that we do celebrate Christmas on December 25th? It only happens on January 7th. There's no way a child can understand that. But it's January 7th. So they can't understand it. You try to explain it and you realize, it's, should it be that hard? And should they really be, you know, missing school that day and, that, and strictly not being, uh, you know, celebrating when the rest of the Christian world is celebrating December 25th. And I'm, you know, I realize that there is a fear to change these things because we have been taught that these things are bastions of our identity, really. This is all, this all builds our identity. And is our identity really resting upon the rock that is Christ? Or is it about these things? So, um, what does this lead to? First of all, the result would be the people searching for liturgical surrogates. And Professor Kalivas uh, did uh, mention this phenomenon, and in the Latin Middle Ages, it's been written on, you know, the people uh, bring their, they have their little devotions, and they're not, uh, it's only the, the clergy that's really praying the liturgy. I would add to this list, I, I forgot to mention it here, our anamnesis is very confused today uh, because of a relatively new phenomenon of parishes of the Western Rite. Now, the anamnesis of one communion, um, celebrating feasts like Corpus Christi, Sacred Heart, and then you have the Sunday of Orthodoxy in honor of what? our liturgical tradition. We've defined it that way. Now, we could redefine it, but what kind of an identity crisis will we face if we actually look at what we're doing? We don't want to really look at this. We don't want to really, we don't write about it. Um, and it's, it's, I think um, there is a certain level of absurdity that I think that a normal person, unless they're really, I think, intellectual and can see in a very postmodern way some kind of sense in this picture. But if they're told, you know, we have uh, orthodoxy and Sunday of orthodoxy and we can also have, you know, the Sacred Heart celebrated and Corpus Christi and the hymnography of these things is written by Catholic saints. It's inspired by visions of, of certain uh, saints after the schism and I don't know how we will solve that problem um, and explain it if we were interested in logical explanations. So the second result would be the people giving up and just disregarding the word in liturgy. And it's um, this disregard for the word, you can see it 
and it creeps into other levels of Russian Orthodox society. And we'll take a look at one example of this disregard for the word when um, in public discourse as well. But let's look at first at the, uh, the quest for liturgical surrogates. This is what has been called in the Latin Middle Ages praying during the liturgy rather than praying the liturgy. And we're often very proud at the very, um, yeah, very vibrant kind of prayer that you feel in Russian Orthodox churches during the, uh, and, you know, and thank God the women have their heads covered and that's just so moving, you know. And <laughs> putting, you know, their candles up and they're so pious. Um, and you see the following things happening at this liturgy. Um, confessions are heard throughout the entire Eucharistic celebration. I don't know if most of you have seen this, but you can go to any big cathedral in Moscow and they won't even take a break. In my church, this happens in where I go in Europe. Um, you, sometimes some priests take a break. It's interesting where. Um, sometimes it's after the words of institution, sometimes before, sometimes not at all. The best thing is when there's nobody left for confession and that happens to happen right before the epiphysis. You'll have the priest during the entire final moment of that prayer packing up his stuff and marching through, you know, up to the altar. I've seen this happen in Moscow. So, you know, this is a surrogate. It's, uh, we actually do have, in our day, the church has accomplished that everybody goes to communion. You see this in Russian churches. It's a big success, but there's a certain liturgical consumerism because actually it's all about going to confession and communion. Um, if someone doesn't happen to be uh, going to communion this given Sunday, for example, a woman for reasons of these very ancient and wonderful rules we have about not stepping into church or God forbid going to communion at certain times of the month, then they won't come. So what's the point? It's like this consumerism. What do I get out of it? Nothing, so I won't come. Um, there's um, a heightened activity during slow moments of the liturgy, which means readings usually. This can also mean the sermon. Um, is, does that mean I have to finish it yet? Is it? Is my time is up? Is that what no, that means? No, no. Um, okay, thank you. Um, so there's uh, the maintenance and purchase of candles. It's very important. Uh, Father Taft always says that he remembers um, the Rokor candle ladies. Uh, they're ubiquitous. And, but it's, a, it's, it's something to do. And it wants active participation. Um, what's a big concern is cleaning, wiping icons. <laughs> and it's funny how we think, you know, in my big fat Greek wedding, it plays a role in it. It's very important in our liturgical tradition. <laughs> somehow occupied during liturgy, and um, this is a challenge, and it can be solved in many different ways, um, and you do your best, you know, but you see people trying, uh, but you have, a, like I said, demographic groups, you can send the boy, my brother was sent to the altar to be an altar boy at age three, so I don't think it's because his assistance was needed in the altar, <laughs> he was out of my mother's hair at that point, but what do you do with little girls, like especially if they don't have a musical ear, eventually you can send them to the choir to bother people there, but you, you really have this challenge and you feel when you see these efforts to somehow, you know, provide for lay participation, you see that it's sort of uh, absurd, and people are forced into this situation, you know, parents, and they want to they wanna preserve this tradition, and it all comes from this ignorance, you know, and a, a misguided effort to do liturgy. And um, how, why in our day and age do we have this? People do get educations, they do have time to study these things, but there are other mechanisms at work here that want to force um, for different reasons, out of, I think, mainly fear, uh, force people into this absurd uh, behavior. Now, my personal favorite is the Thanksgiving litany, at the end of the Eucharistic liturgy. This is when people really start paying attention, <laughs> fill out anew their list of names, 
and go and you know give it to the priest and people you know they're really focused on this they understand it there's a few litanies and they want to hear the names read aloud and this happens right after the Eucharistic liturgy and I'm always like I think Father Tav mentioned standing in the back in case of fire or benediction and I'm like I'm <laughs> towards the back when I know the liturgy's ending because I'm like oh no oh no it's coming the Thanksgiving litany because it's like that whole new beginning and this is what people understand it's such an obvious sign that they, it's a surrogate for the Eucharist. I mean, what other Thanksgiving litany do we need after the Eucharist? So, um, this is uh, an interesting phenomenon. And uh, so, words have lost their meaning, the words of our liturgy. And I want to come to this quote when words lose their meaning, people lose their freedom. It sort of matches this situation. It certainly wasn't said in reference to our liturgy. Um, but it, 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 it's helpful in this situation, and I think that this tendency for centuries already to divorce the icon from the word uh, has led to a general, the second result that I mentioned was a disregard for the word across the board when we are faced with anything church related or um, a certain lack of, of, of logic. Uh, if you, you see in Russian Orthodoxy, in a fairly recent a year ago, everybody knows this, this outrageous, uh, outrageous, but in a liturgical context, performance, right? Now, the interesting thing of this, regardless of what you think about this, the interesting thing about the discussion concerning this, this act is the disregard for the actual text of what was said there. Now, you hear it's, it was blasphemous, you know, there was sacrilege. And if you look at the actual text, there was no attacking of God or of the saints. It was very disrespectful, and you know, you could, it's fine, you know, no, you shouldn't go around and do things like this in, in the church. But um, the interesting thing is uh, the disregard for the word that accompanied this, and let's face it, it is an iconic word, <coughs> and there were words there. And there were also concerns voiced, and a woman was right now already in jail for over a year. She was interviewed and she said, first of all, I'm by no means an atheist, and I'm frustrated that we did something that we thought was also sort of humorous. She's not a you know, church going or even baptized woman, but she said, but um, it was an act of despair because of certain issues that are just not considered even appropriate to touch upon. I mean, they, the fact that they put um, the mother of God and feminism in one sentence, that's enough for the Russian mind to consider that blasphemy. Mm -hmm. um, but are there issues that, I mean, women happen to be a demographic in all our churches, so do they have issues just like any other group has, like children, like men, like priests, like monastics? Yes, of course they do. That's what uh, life is about. It's about all sorts of uh, things that happen. So, you know, there was, for example, the demographic crisis, the demographic crisis in Russia, that there were more people being, dying than being born. So the patriarch said he called upon Orthodox women to have as many children as possible. So very often the families of priests will have, you know, six to nine children. Um, this can be a difficult um, obligation for the women in the church, and it does lead sometimes to tragedies. Not that it's always a bad thing to have, I'm not saying that. I'm saying it's voiced here. In order not to offend His Holiness, women must give birth and love. And no matter what you say, should this be a topic of discussion within the church because it's a pastoral issue? Yes. Why not? But it's not because the word that is in this what accompanied this iconic um, action is disregarded, and that's very typical for the way we approach life. And I think our liturgy teaches us. So this is to reflect upon this quote, when words lose their meaning, people lose their freedom. And it's, um, it's something to reflect upon when we have real examples of, um, of what this might lead to, and it's, it's really 
rather absurd. So now let's turn to the good news because um, we are Americans, uh, most of us, and uh, we do look at the bright side of things. <laughs> and I would like to say um, that the good news in this picture is what I want to call the eschatological dimension of human error in church history. It's never been perfect. Was the Last Supper, or the mystical supper of the Lord, perfect? Was everybody communicating and doing liturgy in the proper way? No, there was Judas. So from the very beginning, there was human failure uh, present. That just happens to be uh, also inspiring. Inspiring because if you have a realistic vision of the past, you don't look for a golden age in the past. Uh, our problems in church life today aren't going to be solved by looking for some ideal. When was church life ideal? I mean, some of the problems we see in church history, we, um, you know, we wouldn't even dream of possibly living with today. So this eschatological dimension is, uh, fills us with hope because it also can inspire us as long as we're willing to, as any self-help help program will tell you, admit we have a problem. <laughs> because when we don't, then there's really no hope to solving it. And this is a big, big barrier, I think, in all of this, before we can discuss anything, because it's like, you know, you, um, you don't really get a reaction that this even exists, or that it's a problem, all of this. So, by eschatological dimension, I'm thinking it's a humbling reminder of the not yet, this is called future eschatology, not the kingdom that is already here, and um, it's the not yet. And the fact that, and the realization, I don't think we always realize it, that the church is within history, that the church has history, is extremely humbling. That the Son of God entered into our history, which was the first aspect of his humbling of himself. Um, that he limited himself to the space, to space and time. I mean, what did that mean? He couldn't just, I mean, he's God. He's not used to having to wait for something to happen. You know? And the fact that we also have to wait, that we're not perfect, and that we deal with a lot of absurdity in our church life is humbling. Um, and as long as we're willing to admit that and see it, that could be very um, invigorating. And through the, hum you know, humility leads to Vitania, which is a productive feeling. Um, now it's an invitation to reassess, uh, reassess what we're doing. Why do we have to be fearful of self-criticism as orthodox. Perhaps it was like that in the East. You know, there's a, a wonderful book by Peter Brown uh, where he says, I don't know if it's completely correct, but he's generalizing. He says, in the East you had Eusebius, triumphalist. You know, there's this instantaneous victory of Christianity. And then all of, you know, the paganism falls and it's happily ever after after that. Meanwhile, a little bit later, Augustine, uh, you know, very sort of self-reflecting and obviously um, almost a century later, Augustine is like, Antiquitas, uh, antiquity is the mother of all evils for Christians. Like he looks at the past and says we have to see uh, all of the imperfection of our conversion from paganism. And it's always, you know, in this thing about the, um, the how do you call it, the idea of inherited sin from Adam, the Sorry, I don't know what you speak Right, original sin. Well, yeah, so there's a certain kind of, uh, it's not so triumphalist, and the past that we tend to worship and cling on to, uh, what is our past? Is it, is it really supposed to be, you know, uh, idealized like that? And why don't we look forward, as, uh, as we saw in Dr. Clintus's paper, that he was saying, you know, about looking, looking forward. Uh, we have this in our history of being triumphalist and saying that we have a very glorious past, and and that's where we want to remain. I think we're also not so, perhaps not so sure about the future, and perhaps our faith is not that strong that we have all the gifts in the Church of the Holy Spirit that were there from the beginning. So the Church, having from day one, from the apostles, so-called apostles' council, the whole thing. Uh, began with a huge reform, of no more or no less of the law of Moses. So it's not
not like a change or um, is, is foreign to our history. So I, I think that I've gone way over my time, but um, it's also a call to renewal. And let's just click into the rest of what we're saying. So humility, reassessment, renewal, these are all positive things and they all come to this one word. That is, of course, that involves change and it's, it's a very productive change. So I want to suggest, I actually had some information on um, our liturgical commissions in the Russian church, but I'm not going to cover that. Um, perhaps uh, just I'll just leave it up here. Don't worry about that. No? no? All right. Um, See, I, I don't really think about the temporal as good orthodox. So I'm going to just <laughs> release myself from those cumbersome <laughs> ideas um, of time and meditation. So, um, this is, uh, there are two commissions in the Russian Orthodox Church responsible for liturgical issues. The first uh, was created a while ago, um, the Synodal Liturgical Commission, or Bogoslužebna Simodalna Komisija, and it was at a very different time, different from what we have now. And it has all but six members. It did it when I was uh, checking up on this. The presider is this, this bishop. Um, it, it's just a bad shot. He's really not a scared man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the job description of this, uh, the official job description, as you see, the commission doesn't really have all that much uh, power. Uh, the job of the Synodal Liturgical Commission, as it says in this document, is the redaction and composition of new liturgical texts and services of the Russian Orthodox Church, as well as the proposition of solutions, propositions, the Synod has to confirm these things, okay, to complex issues of the church calendar. Whatever that means, right? So what they've done to date, uh, basically, um, that the activity is ratified by the Synod. It was a production of services to new saints, you know, like the new martyrs, and uh, there's this activity. And then the only reform to the liturgy was something very hard to understand, the insertion of Lord save the pious into the divine liturgy, and nobody can tell me why that happens. <laughs> <laughs> of all things, they insert this archaic thing that has the least meaning to people today. So. You know, that, there you have it. There might have been other small things, but this is basically the crux of what's happened. Then, uh, more recently, there has been the creation of this Commission on Issues of Liturgy and Church Art. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I think I'm coming down soon. It's called <coughs> the Commission Mir Sobornova Prisutstvia. And this Mir Sobornova Prisutstvia in Russian is something that's supposed to happen between big councils of the church. It's supposed to constantly be working and preparing like documents that the council is supposed to look at. So this was created by a decision of the Council of the Russian Orthodox Church of 2009. This commission has 25 <coughs> members and there's a woman in this commission. Um, so, you know, there, there you see that and from insiders uh, I know that there are also very different types of people, church politically, that sit on this. But there are some superstars, you know, there's Hilario Motfeyev as part of this commission, there's Father Tsikhan Shevkunov as part of this commission. Um, there's names that people know, that said uh, Father Nicholas Boloshov, uh, the big names of the Russian Orthodox patriarchy. So, um, this commission, uh, Father Michael Shontov is the secretary, a uh, friend of some of us, very leading liturgist, not only in Russia, but on uh, the international scale. So this is the uh, presider, uh, the Episcopal Marki Yagoriski. And what can I say about this um, commission? There were several documents prepared by the commission. Um, I'll focus on the interesting what I find most interesting in the context of our conference, because some of the issues aren't really, interestingly, don't deal with the very basic problems of our present-day liturgy. Um, there were there was a discussion of the triodia. That there's a different redaction, different translation available in Russian, and uh, there was a document that said that we should use them. Then there was uh, a document about I I, I can't 
right now focus on the others, but I'll say there was this project of a document, it was called Project Documenta, a liturgical language published for discussion. It was first, it was published as a, just a project, not the final document, in June 2011. And it quotes our favorite quote from 1 Corinthians 14, uh, and it says that the church always considered intelligibility important. There are other interesting quotes. Father Taft mentioned that the Patriarch Alexis said that Russians understand the liturgy, but in that document they quote Patriarch Alexis as saying, yeah, our, our, our people don't really understand the liturgy, so we should do something about this. So his musings on this are quoted there. And um, I'm sure he said both things, but you know, so that says that. And what the document proposes is a Russification of the old Slavonic, just a modification of the language, but not celebrating in Russian. It doesn't go that far. So some of even insiders just, you know, were like, well, either do it or you don't, but you don't create another language because it doesn't exist. You know? So it's sort of like, it's always some kind of fear of really uh, doing what needs to be done. And now there is a certain wave of, you know, conservatism for different interesting reasons. You see this in the Constantinian era. Uh, there are different, I think, phenomena today that you can compare when you see the church gain political influence and become wealthy. You know, and you can observe some certain parallels. But you can't, you know, you can't take that too far because you can't forget that we should have the benefit of hindsight. I mean, we have a lot more history behind us and lessons that we could have learned, but you see certain things happening and a certain kind of neoconservatism with grasping onto the outer things and you feel a lot more orthodox if you look and walk and, uh, you know, do prostrations in an orthodox manner. So, this was heavily disputed in the internet and end of story, it was entirely ignored by the recent uh, Bishop's Council. It just didn't come up. There was one decision, or two, and it was about the date of the celebration of the new martyrs that the the, uh, the bishops' council, um, uh, you know, decided. Uh, and this was not even mentioned. And it was basically um, buried. And there was an uproar, and certain certain people that do spend a lot of time expressing their opinion in blogs about this. So, thank you. That's all. Thank you very much, Sister, for your presentation. I, I, I wanted to know where that quote came from when uh, words lose their meaning and lose their freedom. 
they are attributed to Confucius. Confucius. Um, I used that as an aid. It wasn't said in a liturgical context. I, I don't even know what context it was said in. It's used by, you know, sometimes you can choose a quote that seems to fit into your situation. And I think this is a helpful quote in what I'm describing. Okay. And, and the freedom you're, you mean in that context is what? By freedom, I would mean um, the freedom that um, <coughs> truth gives you according to Christ's promise. And the truth is in the word. You know, how can you believe if you don't hear? And uh, the truth will liberate you. Um, if you don't have that, then you find yourself a afraid, and that is the first enemy of liberty. Um, you find yourself posing because you're looking for surrogates to your newly found orthodoxy. A lot of people are new to orthodoxy. All right, they're not already so new now. There's some people that have been born into orthodoxy, but there's a certain kind of there's a deep disorientation. There's a fear of looking at our history because people are very well educated. Many of these people are well educated in other fields. Sometimes even in this field uh, of, of theology, but they can't take, look what's happening also with the um, actual approach to Soviet history. Where is, you know, in the 90s you had this, you know, interest all of a sudden, you know, in these horrible, Accounts of and digging up, you know, the the trials of the new martyrs, and you had this great interest in really sitting down and it's what we call in German outside Andersen to take apart, sit down and take apart and figure out, you know, come to terms with your past. All of that was closed down, and the red flags went up, and there was a newly most of you know about this development. Um, and to, to point out what's good about our Soviet history. It's also our history, we should embrace it. It's not a sign of strength, especially not of spiritual strength, when everybody needs that, even in your own life, you can't move on if you don't, if you don't see, that's what anognosis is, it's a proper memory. Why do we have confession of the faith, profession of the faith in the creed before we go to communion? In some traditions, we also have proper confession of our sins, because you have to restore a proper memory in sync with the church in order to move on. We can't do that in Russia, because we haven't come to terms with that. And we, for various reasons, we don't want to talk about it. My church, for various reasons, I feel, I'm not an official spokesman of my church, but, you know, for what it's worth, we aren't saying things about this. We, we aren't able to, to, to be a voice in that. There's a lot of fear of saying anything. It's as if everything will crumble if we actually look ourselves <coughs> in the face and with a self-critical uh, look. But we can't because we're not ready for that. Our faith is not strong enough. It's not a sign of weakness when you have the, all right, sometimes they go too far, you know, but the self-flogging or whatever you call it, the Germans after the Holocaust, or, Catholics, I find, are very self-critical, but it's not a sign of weakness, you know. They don't feel like their faith in Jesus Christ is going to crumble because they're fallible. And we, by the way, aren't the ones that, that think that we profess an infallibility of our main bishop, but in practice, we're very afraid to admit to any fallibility there. I, if I can just pick up on that, I think that Perhaps one more perspective, if, if this is an appropriate time to make mention it, that we could explore in another conference of this nature, is the role that mobility has played um, in our clutching on to the outer um, aspects of, of something that's also very important. Mobility, you said? Yes, mobility, the, the fact that, that we've traveled so far, and, and then from an indigenous point of view, the the, the, the fact that language has meaning in place, and I think there's another legitimate uh, field to, to uh, apply analysis on this whole uh, idea of the Thank you. Thanks. I think you're in. Peter, you're in. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
uh, with the new markers. Uh, I don't know if you've read Ksenia Lushenko's article on the decanonization, which is not an accurate term, but the, uh, on what? On, on this revisionism of the new martyrs, where uh, some of the there's a whole slate of uh, canonized new martyrs who were removed from the calendar, from the liturgical calendar. Uh, there are some relics that have been removed from the monasteries. Uh, there's considerable controversy about it, as you probably know at the last synod. Uh, Archpriest George Mitrofanov, who is one of the most outspoken critics of the Soviet period of uh, history, has been removed from the Commission on uh, Canonization of New Martyrs. And this development is, seems to be quite um, alarming, in the, um, especially in the larger picture. Revision of the traditions. Why are they removed? Uh, the, there is no official explanation. No, the, but where are the facts? Uh, the facts are that, the the street. that <laughs> some of <laughs> the, the official stories, insofar as it is given, is that uh, there are some people who have collaborated with um, the authorities under torture, uh, named some names, and so they. Consequently, they have been canonized too rapidly, and the people who have named names of people who have later been arrested and tried should not be in the pantheon of saints. This, is, this actually is opening up a huge can of worms because that would include some of the earlier canonized saints, the very popular saints. Uh, but it's, um, I'm especially interested in how Brokor is. I can't answer your question, Inga. I think you know more about this than I do, so I just don't know about that particular thing. I don't know. I, I, I've, what I know about this is stuff that's written about the general just forgetting of the importance of, I mean, what does it mean to have new martyrs? And it's not really clear what, you know, what we're doing when we go to North Korea and hug these communist leaders and build a church there. And, are silent about 78 percent of the Christians there being in concentration camps. Mm -hmm. It's just not something that, as a Western Christian, you can swallow lightly, I would think. But um, in certain parts of the world, I guess you do. So anyway, <laughs> look at this nice picture. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for this truly excellent presentation. Thank you, Father. I think we have to realize, in this context, uh, how difficult it is for any social groups, be it a country, a people, a church, to face up in any honest way to their own reality. That is to say, to their present situation and to their past. Uh, why is the South of the United States now Republican? Racism. Because Lyndon Johnson forced through civil rights. The South was solidly Democratic, now it's Republican. Why? Racism, period. No other reason. Uh, the only ones who were forced to face up to the reality of their war crimes during the Second World War was Germany. No one else was. Not the Soviets, not the Americans either, nor the British who sent people back in sealed wagons into Yugoslavia to be slaughtered by Tito, or those who sent the, the uh, Russians who had uh, uh, defected back into Stalin's hands. So this is a very, very normal and difficult human problem. Catholic Church faced up to its past at the Second Vatican Council. It wasn't easy, and we've still got now the right-wing neocon wackos trying to turn the whole thing back now, you see? Uh, so you've really, uh, you've had the courage to put your, you know, your fingers right on the pulse of a very difficult problem, extremely difficult. Churches have to do it, societies have to do it, groups within society have to do it, Takes a long time though. Thanks for trying. Maybe <laughs> one more question. It's 
my name is Timothy Petitis, I'm an assistant professor here. I, I enjoyed, uh, throughout your talk, I was thinking about the recent Saturday Night Live skit about Christ coming out of the tomb with a machine gun. And I was thinking about the role that humor plays, because so many people attack that, and I think the role that humor plays, or ridicule plays, if we've got the wrong approach to something, or if we're idolizing something in the wrong way. And um, when you sort of culminated with the pussy riot, I, I really understood where your whole talk was going there, and that kind of speaking truth to power sort of uh, approach. I've been going to Russia quite frequently recently myself, and uh, sometimes to work in orphanages so I can uh, establish my social ethics bona fides. Other times just to write or... And my experience is really just the exact opposite of yours, of liturgical life in Russia. To me, it seems very liberated and, um, and very, very free, and the women seem very powerful and important in the church there. Um, the priests seem like the absolute slaves of the people because they cannot escape this duty to constantly hear everyone's petty complaint and confessions constantly. And, uh, and it, my experience of it is, is a very uplifting and deep prayer. And uh, I think just the opposite of yours. And I, that's why I have one, one story. I had, a, I had a cousin who was raised Roman Catholic in Germany. We happened to go to a Greek church in Berlin, which is a very multi-ethnic parish. And she was saying how, how much she liked an experience of liturgy where when people were tired of talking, or tired of praying, they just talked quietly during the church. <laughs> or where people were free to bring their children to the icons all throughout the liturgy. And she said she felt growing up in a Roman Catholic parish in Germany that children were unwelcome and she felt completely oppressed. So I think a lot of it is perspective. At different times in our lives, we need different things. And I think a few years ago, it really bothered me that we didn't have congregational singing. And now at this point in my life, I really like to be left alone. I don't want that, ob that obligation to be constantly saying something or doing something. So I think that's one reason why reform is slow, because we're all at such different stages. And to have something that gets everyone at, at the same time is difficult. And I appreciate it because maybe I'm idealizing a little bit Russia to see how it feels and looks to you. And I think that's going to be helpful for my spiritual life because, uh, because right now I'm just, I'm just loving it just the way it is. So I thank you for your talk. Do you speak Russian? Yet. Okay. So you don't understand the word as a liturgy there? Well, I, I follow along with the book. <laughs> Plus I'm a, I'm a seminary professor, so I really understand where we are. Okay, thanks for sharing. Father Philip, what's our schedule? <laughs> but before we before we do our schedule, we need to thank Sister one more time. Thank you. We can have a half an hour break. Do you feel you need a, a good break? And then um, we'll have a panel. So the final thing will be the panel and the conclusion, and then Vespers. Uh, thank all of you for coming. So there's more coming. <laughs>